Corinthians that actually moved down here and worked down here, and they're just ultra friendly and um, straight up type of people. Just straight up, uh, it's a it's the most beautiful thing. Anyways, yeah, now I've made some Canadians very very happy. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Ah, uh, we love Canadians. Oh, did I not? I didn't plug in the computer today on the laptop. Oh, okay, thanks. All right, so it's my fault here. I see. So I have to plug it in, uh, and then the uh, the computer will actually get a little charge, and then we'll be back up and running here. <laughs> you got to charge these things because they just go off, and uh, yeah, charge the battery. That's your consumer tip for the day. Make sure your batteries are good and going. And something that I've done around here, this is a real consumer tip, by the way, uh, that reminds me to tell you about this. Rechargeable batteries are really not so bad. Um, I have a lot of things in my studio that require batteries, such as mouses, and I have two of them. I'm talking about the electronic mouses. So if I have two computers running, I actually need those. Uh, to actually operate, and then I have a keyboard that actually runs on batteries. So what I do is I buy the double A's from CVS and Energizer and Duracell. They sell these little charging stations where you can put four or six batteries or more on there, and you don't have to go buy in batteries every single time, and they last just as, as long as a regular battery. But you put them in the charger for, you know, four or five hours, and they're like new, and there you go. So there, there's a, a good thing. Charge, you know, if you're going through batteries for remote controls and this and that and gadgetry, we all have to put batteries in something around the house. Get the char- the rechargeable ones. Some of you already have done that, have gotten smart, but some of you don't know how to mess with it. It's it's easy. You just put them in this, the uh, the yeah the charger, put put it in, and then it'll turn green. Um, you don't have to be a rocket scientist by any means. Okay, uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch uh, breezed through the home stretch of confirmation hearings yesterday, and some of Democrats they uh, struck a uh, a definite public posture, I guess is what you could say, while looking behind the scenes for a possible deal that could set up the next Supreme Court nomination battle. Gorsuch, uh, which is the forty nine year old. 10th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals judge came through three days of ruling hearings. If you watch them on the C-SPAN, it was just the damn man, they just sunk into him. I mean, I, I expected nothing less, but you will have to earn 60 votes for confirmation. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumar of New York said today, or excuse me, yesterday, referring to the threshold for ending a filibuster and preventing the minority party from blocking confirmation. Here's Chuck Schumar. He says, Judge Gorsuch's, not, Gorsuch's nomination will face a a closer vote. As I have said, he will have to earn 60 votes for confirmation. My vote will be no. But uh, Republicans who hold 52 seats in the upper chamber have the option of changing Senate rules so that a filibuster can be ended with a simple majority vote. Democrats, when in majority during the Obama administration, made the rule changes effective for all non-Supreme Court nominations. Democrats are leery of pressing the ongoing confirmation process to the point Republicans invoke the so-called nuclear option as if it would make a subsequent Trump nomination a a fait to comp that. But, you know, they're going to – I have a good feeling that they're not going to have to use the uh, the option. It is an option. It's on the table. And uh, there's speculation. I know Newt Gingrich has said that Paul Ryan, he needs to step down. If the health care doesn't go through, he's not able to pull these Republicans together. Republicans – have been divided with this health care all along. I don't think it's so much Ryan's issue. We get uh, people that just, just have a lot of feelings about this particular thing. I think finally Donald Trump finally spoke intelligently and effectively uh, when he spoke to Republicans, when he went over to the Senate and said, look, guys, you know, you're going to pass this thing or not. And they gave him the ultimate, uh, you know, see, if you don't do this, you're stuck with Obamacare. It's going to implode on you. And for seven years, you said you had a better plan. 
And now Americans are waiting on you to make this decision. So if it's going to have some bearing, uh, we're going to find here in the home stretch today whether or not that made the difference. But we need to get this thing fixed, and it needs to happen. We already know that Obamacare is a bomb. It bombed out. We know it's not working. So um, is there any perfection? Is there anything? Things can be modified. Things can be changed, but it has to be better than what we're getting right now. And he has opened his doors to everybody that you can imagine to try to do the right thing, to make it fair for everybody. I honestly think our president, his heart's in the right place. Now it's to see if Republicans will actually get together and do the right thing. And to me, the right thing is to ensure Americans with fair health care and not a health care program that's actually going to make us broke um, or leave people that really do need to be insured insured. And I know a lot of people are worried that they're not going to get the proper insurance and that their premiums are going to even be higher because we've heard that. And uh, or it's just going to be as bad or worse. And nobody wants that, God forbid. And I don't think Trump would want something to be signed to say something would be worse because this would be a great catastrophe. This is something Hillary Clinton, if she ran in 2020 or any Dem, would actually be able to go and say, look, you failed miserably on this. You accused Obama of all this other thing and you just screwed up health care. And then you're going to get a bunch of angry voters on your hands. I can't imagine this being one of the pinnacle things that Trump ran on. I just cannot imagine that it's going to be that horrible. I can't, but I'm glad the people are being cautious. That's a good thing, but don't fight against what you've been saying for the last seven years. It just seems, uh, unless you have something better, which anybody that's really read this thing intelligently says this is so much better than what Obamacare has put out. Here's a uh, story that I stumbled on uh, earlier today. This is just terrible, and uh, I've been told this by several people that work in military or military intelligence, but the top U.S. general in Europe told lawmakers today uh, that they see evidence that Russia might be supplying the Taliban in an effort to undermine the United States in what could be a significant turning point in the Afghanistan conflict. Uh, They said, I've seen the influence of Russia of late, increased influence in terms of association and perhaps even supplies to the Taliban. And uh, who says this? Army General Curtis. Scaparati, the head of the U.S. Military European Command and the Supreme Allied Commander for NATO, told the Senate Armed Service Committee. Scaparati did not specify what Moscow may have been supplying to the insurgents, but until now, top Pentagon officials have said Moscow has only been influenced the Taliban to an effort to counter NATO. Officials say Iran and Pakistan have also lent support to the Taliban in the past year. So since the withdrawal of foreign NATO combat troops from Afghanistan at the end of the year, it with only a smaller U.S.-led uh, advice and training mission left behind, um, Sangin has seen as a major test of whether Afghan security forces can hold off advancing Taliban fighters. And we've lost a lot of military personnel over there already. And who is the players? Who's the nefarious players on there? Afghanistan, okay, in Afghanistan, Iran, who? Russia. Terrific. Not a big surprise there. Don't you think a little counterintuitive? Getting us, getting our people killed. Thank you very much. We know who our enemies are. We need to really, we need to really stand um, and make a stand because we are just losing too many people over there. And what the hell are we doing? When these folks are supplying, and and, and they've been doing it over in Syria, we already know that, but now they're doing it all the other places. And just to think of how many troops, how much money we've been spending to help these people. Friggin' idiots. Yeah, Russia's no friend of ours. Iran, we've definitely known, but man, there's no love there. I, I hope there's some tough talk out of the Trump administration for this crap going on there because when, whenever it just puts our, our troops in more harm's way like this, you know, we knew that Hezbollah and all that was, was with, with Iran, but now showing that the equipment is coming from Russia, thank you very much. There, I mean, there has to be some condemnation there. The who, Where's the UN? Why, why aren't they screaming? Why isn't this front page news? If Fox News put it out. 
The AP didn't. Do you think that MSNBC and NBC, CBS, you think they're talking about it? No, they're not talking about it. But they were more concerned about the uh, meddling with the Electoral College and all this other stuff with the uh, voting rig to the Russia influenced directly the elections, which found out that that's not true. We're more concerned about those things. And then when it has to do with our troops in harm's way, they're not talking about it. Another derailment in New York, interesting enough, I don't know what it is with all these trains coming off the track. Luckily, this wasn't uh, a big Big issue, but the rear of the train is still on the platform. All 248 passengers have exited the train in one report at the station, according to Amtrak. Uh, this express train, 2151, derailed about 9 a.m. It was leaving New York Penn Station, causing several uh, service in and out of the uh, station to be delayed while authorities investigated the incident. And this train originated in Boston and was heading to Washington, D.C., uh, yeah, major travel delays when a train that covers, uh, well, 248 passengers to one destination. Why they're coming off the tracks like that, that's, that's what, that was at the station. I guess it's better off the station at lower speed, but Jordan Geary, he's uh, writing a New Tr uh, Jersey Transit. He says, train just collided with another oncoming train, blew my window out, and into me. Thankfully, everyone is okay. Huh. Well, this is a New Jersey train. Just collided with another train? Blew out my windows? Yeah, that's a tweet that just came into New Jersey Transit. Interesting. The rear of the train was still on the platform. So there was kind of two incidents, one with Jersey Transit and then with Amtrak. So there was two reports, and I'm just learning about the New Jersey tr Transit train. And I used to actually take the New Jersey train from uh, Upper Montclair into Hoboken, and when I used to commute, commute into New York City, this we're, we're talking the 80s here, folks, um, and then from Hoboken, I took the PATH train into New York, and uh, to the subway, ultimately, my destination was 57th and 7th Avenue. I worked uh, right down from Columbus Circle, right near the uh, where the Hard Rock Cafe was, where the Cadillac was sticking out there. Yeah, for years, it was there. And I worked on the seventh floor uh, at 57th and 7th Avenue. Yep, WMCA. That was my first job officially in radio. Got to meet some really cool people. And the late Alan Combs, uh, which, you know, was uh, was a liberal, but one of the nicest liberals that I met. I met him in the 80s when I was working at WMCA, and he was one of the nicest Nicest guys that I'll ever, I will tell you, very kind to, to everyone, but even a kid, even to a young, you know, kid, 16 years old, you know, wanting to learn radio. He was very sweet and uh, very giving with his time and uh, very polite to everyone. And uh, him and uh, my dad got along very, very well. My dad was very conservative, but man, they used to have the hell of a conversation about politics and it was fun. But uh, Alan, that was a little stint that he had for two years at WMCA, by the way, um, before I think it was, yeah, the contract at, uh, it was ABC or NBC. It was an NBC. Um, they just didn't renew the contract. I think they changed formats. And then he came over uh, for two years. And so that was a pretty big deal. And he used to have a, well, people used to love to call into the show because, man, they just hated his views or the left liked it because that at that time, they really did have fair and balanced radio where you had to have for every Republican, you had a, you know, a liberal in the building with a show too. Um, but, uh, you know, you can have all Republicans now or all Democrats on a radio station, but we do know this for talk radio, there's more conservatives on the radio than liberals could air America that backfired completely. And the other Testament, and they say as much as America is divided, you know, with uh, conservatism, there's more people that voted for Donald Trump to the left than we'll ever know, uh, or people would ever admit, they, but they won't admit it because obviously they'll get canned or they'll lose their friends or their spouse. They they won't talk to him anymore. Uh, but I, I this all this division that uh, people talk about, I I just I'm convinced 
uh, it's a rouge. I, I just don't think people are that is divided. I think a lot of people just uh, they they don't want to admit because of their social standings, um, their their backgrounds or whatever with their associations. With 